the environment is set up for boys not to succeed and it's gotten increasingly worse. And you can see this with why Jordan Peterson is so popular. Self-censorship is more, you know, so common on colleges now and it's like the last place where it should be common. Yeah. Know, they ought to be able to explore those ideas. So many people are afraid right now. I tried to get as much into the public record as I could. Was there anything when you actually got access to the state you started digging through it where it was either contrary to what you uh, assumed or or it was like way more extreme than you thought. Did that happen or? Yeah, yeah, in two places. Do you have any particular feelings about uh, men in school? Women are destroying us now in admissions. Oh, um, totally. Yeah, what, do you have any thoughts on that? That's a very vague question. Do you, what, do you think there's something more specific that we should do about it? Or is this like a foregone conclusion that we've discovered that women are just better in classroom environments than men? And unless we all take Adderall, we're not gonna be able to catch up or something like we're just like doomed to fail on that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I am very pro Ritalin. That, that is for sure. But, okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I think the environment is set up for boys not to succeed and it's gotten increasingly worse in that regard. You know, what boys there are differences between boys and girls in, in this. I A long time ago, I had seen something where um, if you looked at reading levels in public schools, the boys would be well behind the girls. But if you looked at homeschooled kids, you would not see that. Uh -huh. And I think part of that, it's like, well, what books are you gonna get these kids to read? The boys are gonna be much more likely to want to read all the violent stuff yeah. that might be deemed inappropriate. I mean, my kid, he ended up graduating from Stanford, swore that he was never going to want to read at all. What got him to read? Captain Underpants. You know, oh, I remember, was, yeah. <laughs> that's That was the book, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of things, maybe they're not going to be as excited about reading Little Women. The other thing is they're going to want to compete. You know, so I spent a year in England and I was six, and the system was set up where you'd get Wait, wait, like, what was that last thing? You spent a year in England and you have a... When I was six years old. Oh, when you were so, six. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, so there, every book I read, I got like a sticker, and you could get read it just as far as you want, and that completely motivated me to go super far over these stupid stickers. Uh -huh. But the whole competition uh, really echoed, you know, went with me. But but the reality is, is that uh, you know, in my view, uh, men are getting sort of pushed down in the school systems and such. We focus on um, women in STEM, for example, because there's still some underrepresentation there and ignore the massive differences in, in dropout rates that are going on for the boys. Uh -huh. And you can see this with why Jordan Peterson is so popular. Sure. Right? Uh -huh. He's speaking to those, those uh, guys. Um, we, our kids are not athletic. Um, my kids are going to hear this, and so I feel bad saying that. <laughs> oh, no. And uh, your son's a fan of mine, so if he ever shows his face in chat, he's going to get lit up on it. Uh-oh. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, some are more, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Sure. Uh, my parents met in linear algebra class. Okay. You know. Try uh, okay. We, you know, but, um, you know, so they got into robotics. And we go to these robotics competitions, and uh, they're trying to gear the robotics competitions away from competition. You know, so you can advance the state with with the the teamwork award, uh -huh. and they had a raffle at the end for the girls only to win prizes because they're trying to encourage women to go into the robotics. Uh -huh. um, encouraging women to go to robotics is great, but the point is is that uh, the competition is what drives a lot of these these boys. And if you put in environments where they compete, that can inspire them to to go further. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on why what's going on with the guys? Um. I yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not sure. I guess my um, just on the very 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 little bit of psychology I've read, very very little bit about teaching I've read is um, it feels like for a long time it feels like we kind of just ran under this default assumption that men are just smarter and better in almost every way compared to women. We do math better, we do science better, we just we learn better, we do everything better. Um, and then as we've pushed women more and more in classrooms, I, I think that the, I feel like what everybody thought, even if they would admit it, was that maybe if we push really, really, really hard, we can get women to like 40% if we do really good because women just probably don't have the brains for learning like, like men do. 
And now as we've pushed, I think we've realized that left to our own devices, um, women not only can do can, can hit parity with men in classrooms, but in a lot of cases, um, due to temperamental differences between boys and girls, between men and women, that they can outperform men in classrooms. And I think we have a really hard time in society trying to boost or push what we perceive as majority classes. So it's really hard to get people on board talking about poor white people problems because of white privilege. I imagine it's probably gonna be really hard to have a conversation with admissions about getting more men to go to school. I imagine it's probably a really hard conversation to have because we're so used to leaning on the affirmative action side pushing, well, I don't know if I call it affirmative action, but we're so used to culturally pushing women towards education. So having that talk of like, okay, well now we need to push men, I imagine that's gonna be a hard conversation topic to breach. Or maybe it's not, maybe, maybe in your yeah. school, maybe you feel like, oh no, we actually talk about all the time how we can boost male admission rates for things. Um, I don't know if you feel like that, yeah. No, I don't think that, that that's the case. I think there is concern mm -hmm. that some of these places um, are gonna move towards put more affirmative action for men, but it hasn't been totally established yet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, you know, there's like just about two girls for every guy. That's a that's a pretty bad dating market. Well, depends on who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would go to that school. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. Um, I think another thing that you brought up that was very interesting, um, and I think it's a question we all need to ask more, is having an indicator for success is really important, and we don't always know what that looks like, and we're keen to blame one problem until that other problem is fixed. For example, um, if we talk about like, say, black crime, and we look at the, uh, a lot of people like to look at the lens of black crime through our uh, judicial system, right? And they'll say, as long as black incarceration rates are higher than white incarceration rates, then the problem exists in the judicial system, and we need to fix it here. And there, there is a world where, unfortunately, the world we live in is even if you fix all of those problems, that disparity is not going to go away, right? For, for a variety of other environmental reasons, for a variety of other reasons. And then I think when it comes to education, um, I think it's similar where it's like, how do we know when we've had enough affirmative action? How do we know when um, maybe culturally speaking where the culture is, maybe the exact number of black, white, Asian, male, female, trans, maybe everybody's actually sorted themselves into college perfectly. And the only thing that would change how we sort them would be other cultural changes outside of college. But instead we're gonna use this very, very, very crude tool of admissions to try to rectify all of the perceived inequities of society until we've hit parity on every single person. And that's just an absurd concept. So it was that was a question posed to me by a conservative guy a long time ago. He was like, how do you know when affirmative action is done? Or how do you know when you've done enough and now you need to move on to something different? And I had no answer. I, I truly don't know how to answer that question. It's a good question. Because um, there's gonna be a point where we've done enough for women and now they're, they're good and now it's time to turn back and focus on men. Um, but then people will focus on, well, what about in STEM fields? Women haven't hit parity. Or more women go to med school than, um, than men, but they're not surgeons compared to men, uh, right? There's always gonna be like yeah. another thing that you can fight for and, you know, like you said, um, and I guess I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm very warm to the, to the idea of negative externalities and economics that anytime you use a crude tool to fix a problem, you're gonna get all sorts of these rippling negative effects that'll happen outside of that particular solution. So even if you do fix that one thing, it's being MacGyvered up by four or five or six other things that are now in disarray as a result of that, yeah. Well, and it, it's also weird that we always focus on these averages when it could be, the we would say we have an equal society when we have, all, equal representation in every field when the salaries are like massively different across fields mm -hmm. why would why wouldn't we care about uh the the overall level of inequality sure well, why do we focus in specifically on those those particular aspects mm -hmm. yeah yeah, I, I don't like, um, I mean, I, I would consider myself a progressive. I think I would, okay, I fight with them a lot, but I'm pretty sure I would consider myself a progressive. But um, figuring out exactly what our goals are and exactly what tools we should use is, um, it's just a very aggravating fight because it's all, like I said, all of it is just philosophical conversations relating to ethics. 
and very little of it ever intersects with an actual data point. So then people just end up screaming at each other over what they feel is right instead of what's actually, you know, like affecting greater outcomes for the affected people, which is always frustrating. Same thing with things like rent control and other and other sorts of like economic policies in the U.S., where people think that if they just like focus really hard on one uh, on one market thing and then they ignore everything else that happens, that they're going to actually like create better outcomes for people. And it more often than not, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah. You know? Well, and I don't think we're focused, we're often missing the focus on the solution because we're too busy trying to figure out blame. Yeah. My kids fight, one of them, you know, breaks the other kid's arm. What, uh, we don't care whose fault it was. We just need to fix the, <laughs> fix the broken arm. Sure, yeah. Um, and the way it stands now to deal with, uh, I think it used to be the case more that we were in the victim blaming. It's the black family's fault that you have all the crime stuff. Now it's flipped. We, we got to be able to have the honest discussions on both sides of the board to figure out what's actually going, going on. Yeah. Something that I brought up a lot that's uh, challenging is that like, um, I think for a long time, uh, and I'll blame Gen Xers on this, I guess, or maybe I'll blame boomers. I don't know. But somebody older than me. It's never my generation's fault. Um, mm -hmm. But it feels like, uh, it feels like at some point we decided that adversity was something to be avoided at all costs and the most important part of educating or moving a child through life is to remove all adversity rather than we probably should traumatize our kids but having adversity and teaching people to deal with adversity is an is is paramount is one of the most important things you can do for a child um, and it kind of, kind of goes along with what we were talking about earlier like the protests at school and stuff like and i understand my position is probably more radical than most especially as a progressive but like i think nazis going to campus and communists going to cam campus and people having these like crazy protests like in my mind like college is the last time in your life where you're ever going to get to see something like that and be able to discuss it with other students with other professors um, with other groups that you're in it's the last time you can get exposed to that stuff and people running around with this idea that all adversity is bad and our locus of control is entirely externalized and the reason why this particular black person or this particular woman is failing is because of slavery, is because of systemic injustice, is because of uh, Western colonialism, is because of misogyny or patriarchy. And it's like, those things are all part of the truth. They're all part of the story. But that um, that total robbing of agency from a person, I think it does societal harm yeah. and I think it does individual harm too. I think it fucks your mind up and it hampers your ability to navigate problems or, or the world, right? Yeah. It, it's funny because economists get accused of being reductionist. Sure. But stuff on it's all racism is incredibly reductionist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you get videos of like, five, I remember the four or five black cops that like beat and killed another black man on the street and this is still white supremacy. And it's like, right. okay, at some point we have to have another thing, yeah. Everybody does this thing, I'm sure economists do it too, I know economists do it, where somebody has a particular way of, everybody in sociology does this. You, you spend a lot of time studying and you develop this particular lens for analyzing the world and uh, rather than ever being able to look through another lens, you start to see all of life's problems through oh, the reason why this nuclear power plant is inefficient can actually be explained by third wave feminism. Like everything becomes explainable by your particular lens conveniently. And then all of the answers are also conveniently explained in perfect uh, description by your particular lens of viewing society too, which is, yeah, very frustrating, yeah. And, and if someone dares to give a different answer, you shout them down. <laughs> yeah, or try to cancel them or won't, or won't engage at least empirically with the, with the arguments that they're giving, yeah. Which just makes everything so worse for everybody, yeah. Like censorship, uh, self censorship is more you know so common on colleges now, and it's like the last place where it should be common. Yeah, you know, they ought to be able to explore those ideas. Mm -hmm. I've got a friend here who teaches a, a class on polarization, <laughs> hugely popular. Students want to have be in a space where they're free to debate without getting without worrying they're going to get run out of town. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, class is enormously successfully and Jerry Seinfeld in there talking about cancel comedy. Mm -hmm. um, but so many people are afraid right now um, and, and we just haven't set up good environments for them to be able to debate these things. Yeah, and then when you, and then the, the saddest part is you mentioned Jordan Peterson. I don't know what your son is. I don't, I don't like Jordan Peterson's politics. I think his, uh, his psychology is good, but everything else I hate. But when you're unwilling to have these conversations 
on college campuses or anywhere else, broadly speaking, and when you're unwilling to have the conversations, then you're basically completely ceding all that territory to the Andrew Tates, the Jordan Petersons, the Ben Shapiros. And if you're not going to talk about, you know, whatever particular edgy, you know, the topic about trans people in sports or anything like that, if you're not going to talk about it, well, you know, Dennis Prager would love to talk about it or all of these other conservatives, right? people, they would love to have these conversations. And like you said, I do believe that there is a, um, I do believe there's a big inoculation effect of being exposed to an idea and then getting to sort through that in a responsible manner that protects you from being so easily captivated by it in the future. Future, and you totally yep. forgo that in a college environment. And it's funny because like when I debate people, usually the way that I pull people away from other more radicalized places is it'll usually be nowadays, it's usually on a factual disagreement. Somebody will say something like, um, um, I'm trying not to bump into any areas where we might disagree a lot, but somebody will say something like COVID or vaccines, okay? I don't know what your opinion is on any of this stuff. But somebody will say something about like COVID or vaccines, and then I'll bring up a factoid that completely shatters everything they're saying. And oftentimes I'll get like, people will message me like, hey, I used to be a big fan of this guy, and then I watched you this debate, and you said these two things. And, and once you brought these points up, I'd never considered them before, and now I can't listen to anything this guy says. And while I see that happening on my side, where I'm pulling people away from those more radicalized audiences, this happens just as much, if not more, on the opposite side, where somebody is saying like, you know, I used to be a big believer in the establishment, I used to be a big believer in government, and then Fauci said masks didn't work for us, and now I don't know if I can trust anything they say. Or, you know, they said this particular thing about how many, what happened at January 6th, or what happened in this particular thing, and when I looked at it in this other media source, it wasn't totally true. And because they'd never heard arguments on either side, because everybody seems so unwilling to mix it up, it's so easy sometimes to hear one fact and it's like, oh my God, I don't believe anything this guy's saying now. And now I'm fully bought into this whole other ideology. And that's very frustrating to me. Yeah. Well, it, everybody's, the way you describe that, everybody's trying to be in the binary. Either the person saying 100% crap or 100% mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. And that's just not true. Everyone is sort of a mixed bag. And what you like is people to listen, to not have the camps, but be able to listen and engage on on the different ideas mm -hmm. but it feels like everybody's so like webbed together now that like like I, I always joke about this like if you tell me one thing about yourself i can probably guess like 15 other political positions like if you tell me you're a fan of andrew tate i know you're <laughs> probably a fan of jordan peterson i know you probably are opposed to us helping ukraine you probably side with russia more than ukraine you probably didn't you probably think covid came from an uh an, uh, a, a deter, like an actual uh, malignant lab leak. You probably don't think the vaccines are effective. You probably um, don't trust Biden. Well, Biden. Like, yeah, you probably <laughs> vote for Trump. There's like, yeah, there's like, and it's because like when you buy into like one of these ideologies, you have to subscribe to 15 or 20 different things and you can't be off on any of them or else you get completely excised by, and progressives do it too, right? Like yeah. if you're progressive, you have to believe that white supremacy is the cause of all black problems. Um, you probably have to believe that Black crime is either illusory or it's good. Like shoplifting is fine. That's actually fully justified. Um, they, like there's like all these like other racial and id poll and other things that you're like, you have to believe that capitalism is evil. You have to be, believe that Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos are slave masters and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, it's very frustrating and very irritating. Um, well, that's a plus for me because, you know, I'm a conservative Catholic <laughs> in academia. Yeah. And so my beliefs get challenged all the time. And, uh, you know, seeing people as a mix, yeah, that's how I survive. Do you, what, what, do you mind saying what classes do you teach at Duke? Well, I, uh, I'd love to teach a class on race and education, but they don't want me to do that. Okay. So yeah. I teach like uh, intermediate microeconomics, you know, where we're doing calculus the whole time. Gotcha. And intermediate microeconomics and calculus, you said you do, right? With calculus. Oh, with calculus. Yeah. Do you, um, actually, wait, I'm sorry, I'm curious. For your, for the brief, for the help that you did for that Supreme Court case, um, when you're doing research like that, are you just like writing grant proposals to whatever? Do you have to prove this with Duke? Did they approve you doing that research or are you allowed to choose and do whatever you want? Well, I'm allowed to choose whoever I want. Now I was getting paid by students for fair admissions. Okay. And there's limits as to how much uh, consulting work you can do. And I went over those for this case and had to explain that to them. Gotcha. Um, but basically, you know, they were paying me and then I took the case because I got to see six years of Harvard's admissions data, the individual applications, mm -hmm. which is you know, amazing uh, to be able to actually see how they rate these guys. 
Are you allowed to have or maintain access to those databases for uh, research that you can do? Like, would you be allowed to publish, uh, you know, studies or analyses and make those data sets available at all publicly, or at least the results from that analysis? Or is that like a strict no-no? So I, I tried to get as much into the public record as I could. <laughs> okay, so my, okay. My reports are really thick. We've gotten five uh, peer-reviewed published papers out of them so far. I mean, they're in economics journals, so mm -hmm. read exclusively by a few economists. Sure. Um, and that was in part both on my, for my reports, but there's just so much in the public record through this lawsuit that people uh, really aren't even aware of. Mm -hmm. um, Wait, when you say that actually, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what are a couple things where you're like, I, like, I can't believe people don't know this or everybody should know this, yeah. Oh, things like what the SAT score cutoffs were to get a letter telling you to apply to Harvard and how that differs by race. And these were, to go back, these were hard-coded things or these were just like the process of when they were evaluated things? So like, what, what uh, they would do is they, they want to try to get students to apply. And mm -hmm. so they would send them letters based on how they did on their PSAT. Mm -hmm. So, and so they paid the uh, the college board for those names from the PSAT to send the letters. Gotcha. Because and so they, they had hard cut off. Or Black, Black, they, they said, if you're Asian, you know, you might need a 1350 to, to get a letter on the SAT. Gotcha. If you're Black, it might be 1250, just as an example, you know. For, when they're doing the racial coding on this, when you take, I don't remember, when you take the PSAT or the ACT or the, or the SAT, are you filling out like a racial bubble or how do they even do this? Like oh, a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm guessing like every half, ca okay, so if you're listening to this and you're in high school, if you're half Caucasian or half whatever, you always fill out the other, <laughs> whatever the Asian parent or the black parent or whatever is, I'm guessing, for your admissions. Oh, definitely. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's a uh, huge advantage. Uh -huh. um, that, that's one example, but I mean, they'll, they'll tell you how many, there's stuff in the record over time, you know, how many applicants by race were they getting of people who had SAT math scores below 600, mm -hmm. you know, all that sort of stuff is in the record. Oh, geez. Okay. Plus like, you know, different emails from people. I mean, I was always paying attention to the numbers, but there's plenty of, of other stuff. Um, what was what when you were looking through it? So I imagine even before taking this, I imagine that you had strong um, opinions about affirmative action, and I imagine that you had strong, um, not inclinations, um, preconceptions. I guess there's a word I'm looking. There's an in word I'm looking for. I don't remember. But I'm sure that you had strong preconceptions about what you'd find. Was there anything when you actually got access to the state you started digging through it where it was either contrary to what you uh, assumed, or or it was like way more extreme than you thought? Did that happen or yeah yeah in two places mm -hmm. one on the um asian side you know i we've never really had great data on what was going on with asian americans because mm -hmm. they're not that they're not a big enough group for the sort of the national studies i previously looked at okay so and and i guess i didn't have that many asian friends who could tell me that this was the thing that they knew they were being discriminated against but okay. i was stunned when I saw the data and saw clear evidence of discrimination against Asian Americans relative to white applicants. Do you remember what the like approximate score difference would be like on an SAT or a PSAT to get reached out to between like a white student and an Asian American student? Well, often those would be the same. There's only like a few times when they were different. Okay. They would show more in the admissions itself. Mm -hmm. And basically what I found is that the admission rate would be like 20% higher for Asian Americans if they got treated like whites. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. And a lot of that was coming from, uh, about half of that's like, how they were getting rated on the personal score, which uh, all these universities have personal ratings. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a bunch of control, so you can see, you know, what accounts for it. And it seems like they're just stereotyping them. When you say so, personal rating, is this like somebody reads your application, your background, and decides how much they like you as a student or not? Or what do you mean by personal rating, I guess? Well, it's incredibly vague. Okay. But, but the things they list are like evervescence and likability. Okay. Uh, I think there's some sense of overcoming disadvantage. Um, so, you know, it, it was very surprising to me to see how sort of blatant they were, they were at doing it. I think it's a way of just getting 
other preferences you have um, put in under the guise of a, of a, of a fake grading. Gotcha, uh, sure. So this person has an so inspiring background, there. might be like a code word for this person is a race that I like because they have an inspiring background or something like that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And so Harvard went up there and said, no, we're not discriminating against Asian Americans. They just, they didn't score as well on this personal rating. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine doing that with some other group and saying, you know, we weren't discriminating against blacks when they're hiring. It's just they got a bad likability rating. Sure, yeah. Uh -huh. That'll be completely unacceptable. Uh, but because, and when the ruling came out, so, you know, initially the court ruled against us. It wasn't until it got appealed to the Supreme Court uh -huh. that it flipped. When the ruling came out, that was actually very hard because they, they said there was no problem with this Asian discrimination. I felt like if an Asian group had brought the lawsuit with no ties to affirmative action, uh -huh. there's no way they would have accepted uh, what Harvard was doing. Who initially said it wasn't? Was this like a Ninth Circuit decision or who originally said that the... Yeah, Judge Burroughs, uh, you know, it was up in Boston. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure which circuit court that is, but okay, gotcha. Um... Hmm. Yeah. And so then the other thing that was stunning to me is I didn't know how big athlete athletics was at a place like Harvard. Yeah. Uh, Harvard's a small school and yet they've got more sports than any school in the country. Uh, are they like, are they like real sports or is it like the like racquetball and the weird, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say not real sports, but. <laughs> squash, I think you're thinking of, which uh, is, uh, oh, um, that's the sport that, uh, Justice Gorsuch really was making fun of, but mm -hmm. it's, it's sailing and things like that. I don't even and, know. I, you say that word. I hear sailing, like bags of salt water. Is that what you're saying? Is that the name? What is the sport called? Sailing, as in S A I L I N G. You're in a boat. Oh, oh, oh! Sailing, sailing. Oh, those are actually homophones. <laughs> I guess I didn't even. Jesus Christ. Okay, sailing. I'm sorry. I'm thinking sailing, like a bag of sailing. Okay, but sailing yeah. a boat. Okay, gotcha. I'm sorry. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, my bad. <laughs> All right. Yes, and, but those guys, you know, they get the biggest admissions advantage of all. Uh -huh. Well, Way actually, here's a question, because I've heard this argued against, um, I'm sure you're aware, you must be as a tenured professor, that the highest paid uh, public servant in almost every state, I think, or in a lot of them, are like your, your college football department coaches or whatever. Um, yeah. I've heard the argument given that, yeah, these guys are paid a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of scholarships. Yeah, there's a lot of athletic admissions. But kind of like what you said with the legacy admissions, the justification is these bowl games, yeah. the money that you get paid is, is, is worth it, that they ought to be. It benefits the whole school to be running these programs. Do you think there's any truth to that or no? What do you think? Well, it's true for the sports that are actually diverse, uh -huh. like football and basketball or something. I don't think it's true of the sailing team. Okay. You know, no one's watching them, and I, I bet the sailing, the coach of the sailing team isn't making. Probably what the yeah, sure, what Alabama's coach is making, or yeah, yeah, and and to me that makes uh, you know, at Duke basketball. That's that's the thing here, and you know, it does bring a, a big brand to it. I think that's entirely different than a a, a sport where mm -hmm. nobody's watching it. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, you mentioned in your school that you teach, um, you said it was microecon with math. Do you, do you guys, do you, do you find ways or do you ever get into areas where you're like, um, this microeconomic concept is why shoplifting is bad or it's why shrink or it's why minimum wage or why, I don't know if minimum wage, that's probably, is that macroecon? Um, yeah, do no, you, that do would, you, do, that would be micro. That would be micro, okay. Do you ever get into conversations about like political stuff that's like tangential or related to the microecon topics you're talking about, or do you like intentionally stay away from it, or do students bring it up, or yeah? I bring it up a bit. I'm more tied into you know how I do things with my family, you know, and how economists sort of warps the way I do uh, parenting. Uh, so you know, as an example, my second son, um, I knew was not going to go to church when he went off to college. <laughs> Okay. Then, uh, well, what incentive would I need to actually get him to go? Mm -hmm. And that was right around the time when marijuana became legal in Oregon. Oh, geez. Okay. And he said, uh, he said, I, I said, if I, if he went to church for a full year, then I would smoke a joint. <laughs> you know? 
I would and go I back would, to church if my parents would make that same deal. I, you know what? I would absolutely do that. That's a good trade. That's a good brain. Okay, nice. Okay, yeah. Because you know, I grew up in the war on drugs and sex. Sure, so I've got yeah. I, I know, never yeah. smoked marijuana ever. Uh huh. You know? And so he did it, and then I had to pay up. And of course, my little kids wanted to watch, and I wasn't going to allow <laughs> that to happen. Yeah. But I you know went to the dispensary. Bought the joint. It cost four twenty. Explained the situation to the guy. Uh huh. Laughing, and then um, when I pay for it, he says uh, that he was proud of me for following through on the deal. Mm -hmm. And so you know, my parenting was approved by a drug dealer. Yeah. So I can feel good good about that. Did you, what was what was that experience like? Did you? Who was it? Are you a weed addict now, or did you do your one oh, and done? No. <laughs> Uh, it, I never smoked cigarettes either, so it really just burned my throat. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't think I had enough. Um, I should have done a brownie or something. I was going to say, if your son was smarter, so you're lucky because I don't think your son knew much about drugs. If he was smarter, he would have made you eat an edible, and then you would have had a whole four-hour nightmare of experience. Well, I but... told him I would uh, do mushrooms if he went to Bible study each week, but he, he wasn't willing to do that. <laughs> oh, geez, okay. But, Man, I wish my parents would have negotiated with me this way. I would, do, I would do a lot to see my parents do drugs because my parents were similar. My mom and dad are very Catholic, conservative. I went to Catholic school growing up and they would never, ever, ever do anything like that. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you might raise it with them. If, if, if they thought it might bring you back to the church, <laughs> they take the chance. Maybe. The yeah, maybe. Is I want to show them I'm serious. Uh -huh. So my, uh, Same thing with my fourth son. You're actually looking at a skinny version of me now. I've lost over 20 pounds in a month. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. As his deal was, if I got down to sixteen and a half percent body fat, he would go to church for Jesus. one after that year. Okay, uh, and so I'm, I've lost quite a bit of weight. Um, I'm not there yet, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I think he thought that I wouldn't be able to do it. Just but, curious, from a parenting perspective, how do you verify? Like, is your son sending you a selfie every time he's going to church, or are you asking him, like, so what was the sermon, or are you just like kind of trusting him to not lie about you on it, or? Well, I checked in with him and I hope that he wouldn't lie to me about it. Mm -hmm. So, but um, I, I don't think he went every week, but mm -hmm. I think he went enough that I was okay. going to. Gosh, enough for you to burn your throat for five minutes trying to smoke a joint. I mean, it's one thing to tell him I think it's important to go to church. It's another thing to actually say, put my money where my, my mouth is. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you, um, okay, I'm starting to realize I don't, when, when we talk micro econ versus macro, is macro just like, monetary policy and like trade policy and micro is like everything else or what is your big that that would be how i would do it, describe okay. it um every group thinks that their thing is everything sure. so okay uh, i think micro applies to just about everything do you okay so i'm curious how do you feel because it's funny you're just you're talking about like incentivizations of behaviors and everything how do you feel about like disincentivizing things um like obesity using like sugar taxes and stuff do you think that's like effective policy the u.s should consider or are we just waiting for this like new fat loss drug to come through and hope we can just medicate all of our problems away or what is the yeah what are your feelings on things like that like sin taxes i guess essentially yeah i mean i, I think that that's probably a good way of going uh, and that's probably how they should treat marijuana you know as as well mm -hmm. is to have it legal and then adjust for whatever externality you think is associated with it mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting on things like smoking. Smoking, you know, that can actually save the government money because they die right when they hit the social security. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a catch to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It scares um, more things like what's happening in Canada. And I think it sort of relates to the mental illness aspect with um, the suicide stuff. Um, I think you have to be not in your right mind to want to be killing yourself in a lot of those those cases. Um, yeah, I I would I understand what you're saying. I think there's an interesting catch twenty two when it comes to mental illness. I think there is an unbeatable argument for physical illness. I think that if you are staring down the barrel of six months of chemo or hospice as you're dying of like leukemia that's spread across the entire body, I feel like you should have the right to exit at that point. Um, but people with just mental illness, yeah, having especially like, man, people in their 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s even saying like, I'm too depressed, I wanna die now, and I'm gonna have a doctor do it, that's a little bit scary, yeah. Because obviously you can see a bunch of, like, the, the catch-22, like you're suicidal, but you should probably be in your right state of mind before you decide to commit suicide, but a lot of suicidal 
thoughts or suicidal ideation comes from not being in a right state of mind. So it's, a, it's hard to say we give people the freedom to do yeah. that with a doctor assisting it. Yeah. And particularly at the younger ages. Yeah, yeah. I say younger ages, but even, I mean, even in like your 30s and 40s and 50s, like a well-adjusted, like healthy, like even 50-year-old shouldn't be like saying like, okay, I think I want to kill myself now. Like, that's probably not a good thing. Yeah. Which is, and, and counterintuitively, that's where most of your suicide is, I believe, is like the 45 to 55 or whatever age bracket. It's not in teens or young adults or anything. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, yeah, I don't want to sit here if I don't have anything specific. Do you have any, any other broad, random, economic... Uh, I tend to be progressive, but my Egon takes, I think, are they're obviously they're all correct. Um, do you think, um, yeah, I don't know what your son told you about me. Do you have any, uh, yeah, micro-econ critiques uh, for Biden or something that you think the Republicans might get more correct on, like, tax policy or econ policy? What do you think well, about, like, this ghost? Do, when they're at their best is when they're trying to get competition going. And... Um, I mean, I think generally competition can be a good thing, you know, mm -hmm. for bringing out the best in in schools or 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 other aspects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the the problem on the Democratic side is is really do we become so much about the identity stuff that we lose uh, focus on um, fixing fixing the other issues? Yeah, I agree. I think that my my biggest critiques oftentimes with Democrats are that they are very um, they don't respect market forces um, and they think that they can just kind of like pen these away and everybody should do differently. Um, but I think something that's kind of scary is whereas we used to have like a conservative party in the United States, um, I'm trying very hard. I don't know what your political leanings are. I sort of trigger some huge like yeah disagreement. But I would say that like under the new kind of like populist Republicans under Trump, um, you don't really have this respect for. I would say broadly like conservative economic approaches anymore. So for instance, the party of Trump, people that are fans of Trump are big fans of like isolationist or protectionist policy. So yeah, it's a cool switch. Yeah. So now you have like nobody is really fighting for like immigration or market forces or anything anymore. Now it's all we're not going to trade with this country. We're not going to trade with these guys. We're going to protect our labor markets. Um, that decrease of competition when labor is already incredibly tight in the United States anyway. Yeah. I mean, given where I sit, mm -hmm. I usually feel like I can figure out why people stand the way they do. Mm -hmm. And but I really have a hard time on the Trump side with that, um, why he's remained so, so popular. Uh, but I think he has hit on a nerve yeah. uh, that these uh, poor white families have really gotten left behind mm -hmm. and they're being told that they're racist or yeah, I agree. Uh, that they're, and uh, they've got somebody who they think is going to stick up for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I mean, it's a big problem. Uh, the lack of trust in institutions, you know, they don't, if you're a Trump fan, you're not trusting the mainstream media. And there are some reasons not to trust them mm -hmm. on certain aspects. Sure. That's, I'm working on now. It'll probably get me into more trouble is looking about how newspapers report race of the victim and race of the perpetrator. Okay. And so looking over a 10 year period, um, you know, pre Trump, during Trump, after Trump. And, you know, can you name how many um, white victims of police violence can you name? Yeah. Are you can, asking can, me or hypothetically? Yeah. Asking you. Oh, um, the one that I remember the most is, uh, I think he was either white or Hispanic, but I, we kind of mix the two sometimes in the reporting, is, uh, I don't know if you saw the story of Ben Shaver. He was the guy that, like, hands up, crawling out of the room and doing that, and then he ends up getting oh. executed by the cop. That was a really horrible that one. That one where he's pulling up his pants? Yeah, he. Like, I think he reaches oh. down because his shorts are coming off, and then the cop just, like, yeah, executes him. That was he a really... that guy's name. I saw that video. That was so horrible. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not Ben Shaver. That was Daniel Shaver. My bad. But, yeah. Um, yeah. obviously massively disproportionate. Yeah. I do a lot of crime related stuff and that's usually my go. I hate doing it. I don't like fighting against progressives cause I want to fight with conservatives more, but, um, that's usually my go-to is when people talk about how horrible police are and blah, blah, blah. The first question is how many unarmed black men do you think are killed every year by the cops? And generally it's like, I don't know, 500, a thousand, like these are usually the numbers you're given. And it's like the actual answer is like 17. It's a way smaller problem. Um, yeah. Do you ever it, they don't report on this stuff? It's in it's basically race of the victim. If it's a police shooting, it has to be black. 
race to the perpetrator if it's a police shooting has to be white. Yeah, I brought up that example earlier that I thought was so crazy that, and we got full video footage of, I think it was four or five black cops beating to death a black suspect. But I think that that was probably hot in the news for like maybe three or four days and then it kind of went away. And like this, yeah. would, this would have been like George Floyd 2.0 if even like one of these cops was white. Probably, but because it was like all black, it kind of like passed through our yeah stuff. Which, to to be fair, like I'm not saying that we shouldn't be, and I'm sure you're not saying either. It's not like we shouldn't be cognizant of like racial issues and everything. Course, but um, sure. I feel like sometimes the perspective and the expectations that we have on systems are um, unreasonable. So like for instance, and this is such an emotionally loaded argument. I usually can't make any headway here. But like if I'm talking to a reasonable person. Like let's say I could show you one one cop killing a black person for no good reason every single week of, of the year in the United States, would that be acceptable or unacceptable? And the answer is obviously that would be unacceptable. But then if I ask a question of like, how many cops are there in the United States? Well, if there's like, if there's 50 cops and there's 52 bad cop shootings that kill an innocent, that's horrible. What if there are 500 cops well, that's a lot less bad, but probably still bad. What if there are 5,000 cops? What if there are 50,000 cops? What are, even if you increase the number and the person doesn't know, your, your expectations of what you see on the news don't actually change, right? Yeah. And that's a problem because then we set the standard where it's like there can be no racially motivated, no violence from the police force or else it's unacceptable. It's like, but we wouldn't place that same standard on literally any other system. That's un, you can't do that. There's always going to be bad actors and stuff. And you and we go, we so we're so driven by these one-off cases where it's like, okay, well, let's look at the like per capita, let's look at the statistics. Like that's going to be more important because like you could show, I, I've heard like the bank robber fallacy. I could show you a thousand new Chinese bank robbers every single day for a whole year on the television set, and it doesn't necessarily mean that Chinese people are more likely to rob you than anybody else because there's so many of them. You know, yeah. Well, and that hits on a, on a few things. One, um, I feel like with Twitter and such, we're moving to the qualitative rather than the quantitative. Yeah. It, you can't just, you can show that one video and the statistics just become meaningless. Exactly, yeah. But the second thing is I think it actually has really bad effects for these groups. So there's actually been a study done that shows if, uh, if um, some, uh, guys killed in your area by the police that um, high school performance goes down of the kids. Mm -hmm. They don't show up as much. But it's driven solely by black and Hispanic kids. Sure. And that's because they've seen the news over and over again about how bad the system is that it has these negative consequences for them in a way that the white kid doesn't. Yeah. Because it, the white kid never sees it in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to go dig through for this paper, but I feel like I read a paper a long time ago that said your perception of the economy is like more driven by the media you consume than any other economic indicator. That more than gas prices, more than interest rates, more than anything else, if you consume media telling you the economy is bad, your perception is going to be the economy is bad more than like any other particular thing, which I thought was really interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. And then something, we talked about this yesterday, something that's frustrating is sometimes people want things but they don't realize that sometimes what they want is contradictory so this is on the macro econ side but like people are complaining that housing prices are going up and up and up and up and up which they have been because interest rates have been negative zero for fucking how long and then when we finally start to bump up interest rates now people are upset because now housing is even more unaffordable and they can't get a loan for their house it's like okay well what do you want like or people are saying things like students college students can't afford housing because student loans are so horrible we need to forgive all these student loans and it's like okay well now you've got you know 500,000 students are all buying houses now in Seattle and San Francisco in LA like what do you think that's going to do to housing prices like it feels like we kind of want everything sometimes we don't realize that some of these market forces are literally pushing in the opposite direction of the particular thing that you want you know totally there are constraints I feel like that's you're an economist sure yeah it's hard it's frustrating to make people yeah kind of understand the, the both sides of things yeah 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 um any final closing thoughts any other economic thoughts any other things you want to share you got tons of people over a hundred thousand views on this youtube video what do you want everybody to know about it's probably my biggest one here <laughs> it was on jordan peterson but he hasn't aired it yet oh uh, okay that's exciting what'd you guys end up talking about most of the time oh no uh, the supreme court case and sex 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Was it a good factual thing, or was it about how wokeism is destroying America? And I don't want you to spoil it too much, but <laughs> I don't think it was too much on wokeism destroying America. Then I'd be, in, then I might get myself in trouble here. Gotcha, so. gotcha. Okay, we'll see. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I really appreciate it too. If uh, if your son ever catches anything, or you feel like I say something dumb, or if there's anything else you want to contribute, or if you end up writing a book or you want to promote anything, yeah, just let me know. I can always drive you back. We can chat again. That sounds so. great.